Thanks very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm delivering this on behalf of myself and my colleague Becky, who has a session class. She's over there. And uh, like you said, from the UHI out to Hebrides. And in this presentation, uh, we want to tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing, how we visualized Hebridean prehistory through the US Virtual Archaeology Project and some of the challenges and opportunities we've kind of had here with visualization. And through this project, we've been quite experimental, quite deliberately. Uh, what started out as an augmented reality app, and I'll show you some examples of that, has become much more of a multi multi multimedia project, I suppose, structured around augmented reality apps. Um, particularly, I want to reflect on two of the themes uh, highlighted in the session abstract, actually. So authenticity and peopling reconstructions, or not. Should I do that one over there? Yeah, that's all right. Uh, so yeah, some multimedia elements that we've put in project work better than others. And we're really interested in seeing how different audiences respond to different forms of visual media. I'm going to highlight in this paper just a few of the things we've wrestled with in the project in terms of visualizing the past and discuss some of the impacts that I think this has for audiences. But just for a bit of background and context, you first of all, so we live and work in Uist. It's part of the Outer Hebrides, this chain of islands off the west coast of Scotland, uh, so-called there in the blue on the left-hand side. Um, and Uist is home to some really fantastic archaeological sites, local, national and international significance, many very well known in academic terms, probably quite recognisable possibly if you work in Scottish archaeology at least. And many of these sites are really exceptionally well researched and really widely published in academic terms. And Cardiff and Sheffield University's search project has been particularly important here from the 1980s to the early 2000s. And in terms of the impact of this, despite the brilliant resources and the decades of really top quality research that's come out of these projects, the impact locally has been quite limited. And our archaeology in US remains fairly like, kind of poorly understood by the resident communities that live in US and also the wider visiting, uh, that's the time we've done loads of steps today, sorry, uh, and the wider visiting public as well. And often our main consumers of archaeology are a very specific demographic in US, which I'm sure many of us will be familiar with. And our key new audiences who we haven't really reached out to yet are children, young people, and crucially people who live in US and are from US. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, additionally, we've got a few challenges. So that's one of them. Another one is that we've got quite limited uh, heritage infrastructure when it comes to tourism. Only a handful of sites have got any form of signposting or interpretation and in general, quite minimal signposting there. And this is just a few examples. Uh, they're quite faded. So this is the one from Clark Harlan on the right hand side, on the left hand side there. Good information, but quite faded. They wear up on posts, then the cows scratched on them, scratched themselves and now they're down on the floor. And then some, some proper old school um, interpretation there on the middle for doing talk well. Um, and this kind of minimal signposting then sometimes leads to what you can see on the right hand side, which is uh, one of the roundhouses at Harlan with a tent in the middle and some bikes up against it. And it is a good place to camp, I'll give them that. And I think that's just a missed opportunity on our part as archeologists more than anything. But those, that's another challenge that we've got. Um, and although we're not here to talk today about the impact of visitors on archeological sites, it's just worth noting that our archeology span is located in quite fragile and vulnerable landscapes, lots of soft sediment landscapes, especially on the west side. And it's often quite hidden as well. So we haven't got a lot of the upstanding remains that other places might boast. We've got a few wall footings or lumps and bumps in the Macha on the west side, which we as archaeologists know are archaeology, but many don't. So again, just an additional challenge they're presented to us for developing access and, and visitor interpretation and facilities. Um, with those challenges in mind, we created US Unearthed. And um, there's two main outputs for this. First of all, it's the mobile app, which has augmented reality reconstructions of five archaeological sites along the Hebridean Way in Uist. And you can see the top pick as an example of that. So Harlan, today you can see the footings of three roundhouses. And then basically when you trigger it, you bring up this reconstruction of what it might have looked like uh, in the past. And more recently, to support our augmented reality app, uh, we've got this traveling multimedia exhibition to shine a light on US, go out with US as well as in. We've got things like the virtual reality headsets, which include the same reconstructions, but in a different format. So the fully immersive element, uh, 3D printed artifacts and digital interactives and games. And the project's led by archaeologists and working with the developers and modelers from Heal X. And authenticity was extremely important to us as archaeologists, as leading the project, and it was a real central concern of ours, I think, at the beginning. 
and the AR and the VR models are based on detailed research. And three of the sites in particular have been subject to highly detailed excavation. And our models are based on site plans, phasing, comparative examples created in collaboration with other experts in various periods and the members of the excavation teams as well and the directors of those. And so there was huge discussion about things like the heights of doors, the roof pitch, things like that, things that really can fundamentally change by just a few tweaks. And this image just shows uh, an example of the various stages of development for the Norse longhouse at Bornish. I don't think that's the final version, but lots of navel gazing, which really annoyed the developers because it takes ages, as it turns out, um, for them. Uh, but the tension between our desire for what we perceive to be authentic, what, can, what does that even mean? Can we reach it? and creating a valuable experience for users soon became clear. And these are the conjoined roundhouses here at Bronze Age Clock Hallen, um, which you can see. Uh, it's a very iconic and well-known site in Scotch archaeology, I suppose in academic terms, um, as seen through our augmented reality app. And it's sitting there within the Macha landscape. So that's the sand, sand dune landscape, the low-lying landscape in Dalabra in South Uist. And the AR uh, roundhouses, they're triggered when the app uh, scans a QR code at the site. So they're location based. We want people to come and experience these sites in the landscapes. And this launches then this life size model. You can go inside them. You can interact with various buttons and things and it tells you more about the sites. Um, and this launches, uh, it's in the exact location as well. And at the beginning of the project, this was really important to us. We were adamant. We wanted the AR to come exactly onto the footings of the houses. How hard can that be? Look, you can see them, developers, just plonk them on top. And we were quite naive about that. It turns out, again, that's really difficult. Um, so there were a lot of flying saucer situations just before we launched, uh, which is quite disengaging. Um, so yeah, we were quite adamant about that. And part of the rationale for that was the, the, the importance that we place on landscape and landscape location, trying to understand the, the sites as they might have looked in that landscape. And likewise, we wanted all the material culture and things like that to sit in the locations exactly where they were found as well. And again, this proved quite challenging for the, for the development team. And although we eventually got the technology to play ball, we did learn quite a lot from this initial experience. And by the time we start working on the Iron Age wheelhouse at Kildonan, a short walk up, we felt much more comfortable actually about shifting the location ever so slightly, just a matter of meters to ensure that the augmented reality launch was more stable and thus the user experience was more consistent. And in response as well to user feedback after that first launch at, at Hallen, uh, with Kildonan, we made the decision to furnish it a bit more completely using a bit more um, conjecture. And so possibly then another departure from our um, earlier position on authenticity and over a user experience. And just to say the wheelhouse was the most tricky, the Iron Age wheelhouse, if anyone's familiar with the kind of the, the architecture of these, trying to build that in 3D in comparison to looking at a lot of the artist reconstructions in pencil was, was a really interesting experience. Um, but yeah, another example here, this is the final textured interior of the, the Viking Longhouse at Bornish that you saw on the other slide. And the interior models for Halland, the, the Bronze Age site with the roundhouses are by comparison quite empty. And our user feedback data, this initial stuff we're getting out, suggests that this impacts on levels of immersion and user experience. So they, they quite like stuff. They like to see stuff, whether it's in the right place or not. Uh, and then just to say, if, I, yeah, if you go see one more, that's just a photo that it was based on the, the ceiling of the, the longhouse. It's from a thatched house, sometimes known as black houses and other areas, which are a much later uh, structure, but a lot of interesting alignments with the earlier Viking houses. And you might notice that the augmented reality and the, the VR models, they don't, they don't have people in them. We haven't, put, we haven't made computer generated Iron Age or Bronze Age models. Uh, we made quite a deliberate decision not to include people for a couple of reasons. And it's quite interesting hearing Tom's talk talk about avoidance because that's kind of what we've done. Um, so firstly, for most of the sites we're dealing with, we, we know very little about the clothing, the hairstyles, the roles of the house occupants and by peopling our models. We would have had to make decisions on things like gender, age, ethnicity, that we didn't feel we could confidently assert. That's like a whole other part of the project. Uh, but the deciding factor was really that the beauty of location-based augmented reality is that the audience and the users who are using the app can populate these sites themselves. So they are, they are the people. Uh, and this just some example says that there's a photo mode in the app. So you can take you can take photos of yourselves, of your kids or whatever. So the girls there said. So, there's some little ones there saying that they would have stayed in that house because they'd keep their toys in there. So I quite like that. And you get lots of sharing on social media because it's quite visual and it's quite impactful. And just another example there, that's the, the long house at Bornish. Uh, there's the kids on a school trip uh, standing by the fish drying rack. 
It looks a bit weird because that, that it's got a roof on, roof off mode. So that's it with its roof off. That's why it looks a bit like a climbing frame. Um, but yeah, as I've already said, our starting point was based on this desire to create what we thought were maybe authentic and by implication quite realistic visualizations of archaeological sites working with the excavators and seeing if it, it was what they thought it would look like, I suppose. But uh, another key aim of our project was to give people an opportunity to understand some of the really intricate stories that you get from these sites, especially when you excavate them in that much detail. So things like the complex processes of the mummification discovered um, at the excavations at Klachalen. And we realized here that we had an opportunity to create some really innovative and diverse presentations of complex and obviously often quite inaccessible data. It's quite hard to get your head around. This is our attempt at trying to get our own heads around the story of the mummifications and the various different avenues it could have taken. Uh, so we presented uh, stories from Hallen through a variety of layered media, different things, text, models, audio, infographics, as well as animation, which we're storyboarding here. So this is our first attempt at trying to get our own heads around it. And this is a still uh, from the final animation that we created. And you'll observe that we've taken quite a stylistic approach, which is quite a, a significant departure from the realism of the augmented reality reconstructions. And we chose this more stylistical approach in this one for various reasons. Firstly, as a, a, as a contrast, a deliberate contrast with the realism, we wanted to explore a more kind of playful approach, I suppose, to visualizing the past. And, and see how people responded to it. And secondly, uh, we didn't want to provide detailed models. So again, avoidance a little bit of prehistoric people, so quite stylized, shadowy impressions. Um, <laughs> and also finding a way to tell a story about mummified and composite bodies that have really gone through the ringer in a sensitive way and portraying this in quite a sensitive way, especially as the site, the location of Hallen is right next to a, a Christian cemetery that's still in use. And we fully expected that this portrayal would not be for, for everyone. <laughs> We get salad fingers, that's one of the things people have said, or aliens as well. Um, but I think it's, it's, I didn't anticipate that animation would become such an important part of the project, but the evaluation again to date suggests that, particularly for younger audiences, these visualizations are, are important and they, it helps them to understand. We've seen kids watching this animation and they will go and reel it off to their parents and say, this is what happened, and that's been really nice. And another example here, uh, this is a stylized game which invites users to put the composite bodies back together so they're all magnetic and they all pull apart and they've got information on the back which again explains the, the various things that have gone on with the curation and the, the putting things back together. And we've also experimented with how we've visualized uh, the, the artifacts. And in the app and exhibition, we've got photogrammetry models uh, of artifacts from our site, created by Hugo, the one on the left. You might recognize that one, possibly. Uh, but we also 3D printed the objects in the exhibition and then animated the photogrammetry models. Is that one playing, that, that guy there? Will that make it play? So. Oh, well. Oh, I didn't want it to be loud. Oh, well, it's loud, sorry. But we've animated the little, uh, the little carving. That's a Viking style. Oh, oh ring a Ricky. But yeah, uh, so we, we kind of played around with it a little bit. And again, to, per, to kind of prompt some of these discussions on authenticity or what does that even mean, we decided to print them in pink and blue and orange and green as well to just try and move away. They're not kind of a yellowish antlery color. Uh, we've gone for totally different. And these are just some initial quotes from the evaluation for the app. The feedback's been, been positive, but I think for us, the family that said that the app promoted um, and prompted imaginative play after they had used it, the app, the kids, is probably one of our most important pieces of feedback today. And it just reminded us to question ourselves, what does successful impact look like? Why do we do this? And perhaps most importantly, what happens after people consume or engage in any heritage interpretation at a site? In terms of the virtual reality, which I haven't talked about too much, but you can see them uh, using it there in the, in the exhibition. The VI headsets are overwhelmingly the, the most popular part of the exhibition. Over 80% of people who filled in the form said they loved the VR. Um, but having watched this a lot, just observed people using it, we've got this hunch that the headsets, while they've been extremely popular, I think lasting impact la kind of links more closely actually with the augmented reality app where people are still in these places and visualizing these sites in their landscape context and actually get a, part, a, a chance to kind of people the past and choose their own adventure within it, click on that or don't click on it. 
this is much more passive. You kind of use it and it's a great hook, but then it's, it's not very long lasting, I don't think, but I need a bit more data to back that up. Uh, but what is the role of digital technology such as virtual and augmented reality in visualizing sites? For our project specifically, I think the role is in establishing active and long-lasting engagement that changes what people do, how they think about URSS past rather than passive and engagement, short-term engagement. And these are just some of the key evaluation parameters we're exploring just now. And we're just at the beginning of that evaluation process, so hopefully we can share more with you next tag maybe. But I think what's key to this project is through being quite experimental in the use of various different kinds of digital visualizations. We've created a, a sense of fun here, and to an extent, almost irreverence, I think, which has been really important for those target audiences that we have been missing so far. Uh, so from colorful 3D prints to augmented reality selfies, I think it's becoming, archeology span newest is becoming a bit more appealing and engaging um, for a wider audience than previously. That's all right. <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much to our funders and, and partners and collaborators. Mm -hmm.